Legend of Total War here, and today we'll be starting a new series for the channel. I'm going to be covering mod reviews. So, starting with Stainless Steel 6.4, just be spending about 10 to 15 minutes talking about the mod and reviewing it and telling you how much I like or dislike such mods. Now, I'm going to be running this much in the same way that I do the top 5 videos, in that I'm counting on you guys in the comments to let me know what mod you want me to cover next. The top rated mod uh, suggestion will be what I cover, so if you see something in the comments that you want me to cover, make sure to give it an upvote, and that's what I'll do. Anyway, let's talk about Stainless Steel 6.4. So, the way I think of, of this mod is that it's sort of like Medieval 2 Plus. It takes everything that was good about Medieval 2, and extends it just a little bit and pushes the engine to its maximum. Now, if we go into the campaign, there's two errors available, but you have to set it up before you, you get into the game. There's the early error and the late error. Currently, he's got it set up for a late error campaign. Now, the, the early error starts at 1100 AD. The late error starts at 1220 AD. So, going into it, like I said, pushing the, the engine to its absolute limit, there's a whole bunch of new playable factions and a lot of new territory that's available to be played on. Now, there are some things that are cut out from vanilla in that you're no longer able to sail to America, so the Aztecs are cut out of the game. In my personal opinion, I don't really mind about that because sailing to America in vanilla is something that I very rarely do. Um, so this is purely sort of like the European map, you know, and Central Asia. So going through the factions, I'll just show you guys what's available, because some factions that maybe some people wanted to play in Vanilla Medieval 2 may not have been available, but might be available in this. That being said, of course, it can't cover everything. There are there are severe limitations to this uh, engine. Anyway, so we've got Crown of Castile, which is a replacement of Spain. You've got the Kingdom of Hungary, the Teutonic Order, Crusader States, so Kingdom of Jerusalem, Khwarezmian Empire, which is sort of like the Persian, the, the Islamic Persian Empire, I Islamic Turkic Persian Empire. Uh, you've got Norway, uh, Grand Duchy of Kiev, Crown of Aragon, Lithuania, Republic of Venice, Kingdom of Sicily, Republic of Genoa, which is kind of a replacement for Milan. Milan isn't available in the early or late periods, because uh, Milan wasn't as influential as Genoa, at least at this time period, so that's why I think they went with Republic of Genoa. I don't think anyone's going to pluck hairs too much and be like, oh, but I really wanted to play as Milan. It's more or less the same thing. I mean, they're right next to each other. The city of Milan is still there, but it's about what, what countries were influential at the time. So, you've got the Kingdom of Denmark, the Fatimid Caliphate, so that is to say Egypt, uh, Kingdom of Scotland, Cumin Khanate, the Golden Horde, which is the Mongol invasion, the Seljuk, Seljuk, so just going back to that, you can actually play as the Mongol Hordes. Uh, the Seljuk Sultanate, which is the Turks. Uh, Kingdom of France, the Holy Roman Empire, the Kingdom of England, Kingdom of Portugal, Kingdom of Poland, Byzantine Empire, even though it should technically, if you want to get super technical, should be called the Empire of Nicaea at this point in time. Empire of Nicaea, Epirus, and Trebizond, uh, because at this time period, uh, Constantinople had been captured by Crusaders and split the Byzantine Empire for about 50 years. But the Byzantines do, historically speaking, recapture Constantinople for a short time. And then we've got the Moorish Caliphate and the Republic of Novgorod, which is sort of the replacement for Russia. Although you can say the same thing about the Grand Duchy of Kiev. Now let's jump into the campaign map and show you exactly what has changed and what, what else this has to offer apart from more factions. Okay, so this is the campaign map. As you can tell by the lines, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of settlements. There's 199 territories in total, which is the maximum the engine can can actually support. Now, in vanilla, there are 106 settlements at the start of the campaign available at in Europe, but there's an additional six settlements that become available late in the campaign in America, North America, Aztec Territory, and Brazil. So, in total, there's 112 settlements. Now, even though the Americas has been removed, they've still managed to add more territory in the campaign. Now, I've seen some mods, what they do is they just add more settlements, but don't actually increase the size of the map. But what they've done here is they've really stretched out everything to its maximum. The map, I think, is about as large as it can get. So even though there are more settlements, they are actually further apart. There's more detail in the actual, in the actual campaign map, as well as there being more settlements. Uh, in addition to that, looking at the settlements, what I've done is, you might think, oh, wait, well, it's got lots of money. Don't worry about the actual gameplay side of things. Just, I've done a few things, modifications, as in 
cheats to, to build up these settlements so I can showcase it. Looking at France alone, looking at the variety of what units are available. So looking at a at a castle, which again I've maxed out, looking at the buildings, all the unit I or the building icons are exactly the same and pretty much function the same way. Although they do take longer to build and cost a lot more. Getting to a citadel state in Stainless Steel 6.4 is actually a monumental effort and is not guaranteed for any settlement in the game. So if we have a look at them, the settle uh, the buildings, they do function pretty much the same way. It provides food and uh, uh, you know how it works. If you've played van vanilla, you'll understand how this works. Like I said before, it's pretty much just Medieval 2 plus a bit more. But where the real changes happen with Stainless Steel 6.4 is not just the the number of settlements and number of factions, but what type of units and the detail on those units that we see. So this is a complete overhaul of the of the French roster, and most factions do have a complete overhaul. You will see some units that are pretty much the same, like the French Feudal Knights. Pretty much the same icon, functions the exact same way, uh, maybe has uh, some slightly modified stats, but there are a, a couple of them that are the same, like you know Mangonel, Trebuchet, those are, those are all the same, but most of the other units, and this is for every faction, are different. Now of course, just like in vanilla, you do most of your recruiting from the castle, and in your city, it makes the money. If we have a look at Paris, which I uh, built up, it doesn't have much variety. Now, looking at things, one of the major differences with stainless steel is that the availability of troops, even though there's a lot of variety, but the availability of troops is much lower. If I was to recruit this unit, we can see we've only got one unit in the recruitment pool, and the unit pool is at its maximum. So, once I've recruited that unit, it then takes seven turns for it to return. So you won't see spammed armies very often. You won't see like just armies filled with, with dismantled feudal knights. Because, you know, comparing it to vanilla, where vanilla you could have a, you know, a, a recruitment pool of, say, five units that replenishes once every two turns. Now, speaking on turns, the time scale. In vanilla medieval 2, it's a bit weird. The game progresses by two years every turn, but characters only age six months every turn. So you end up having a weird situation where you've still got your initial faction leader who's, you know, 50 years old and started off at 30. When you're in the 12th century, you know, 50, 60 years into the campaign, or even 100 years into the campaign, your characters are still alive. Uh, that's obviously just done for balancing reasons, otherwise your characters would just die too easily, or too quickly. Whereas in Stainless Steel 6.4, everything is aligned. It's one turn per year, so there's 400 turns available to, to play in the, in the late campaign, which is plenty of time to play it. And every character will age one year per turn. So you don't have to worry about a character that was born in 1220 AD and has somehow survived until until 1360, which is absurd. Which, you know, again, it's Medieval 2's sort of balancing issues. Um, uh, let's now look into a battle and I'll show you, you know, what, what some of the units look like and how they perform. Okay, so I've just set up a custom battle over here. I'm going to be playing as the Byzantines and we've set up an enemy with the Turks. The balance of power is maybe slightly not in my favour, but it's more or less even. So I've tried to pick up a, a, pretty, a good variety of units. One mistake I made is actually, I'm not used to using custom battles. But uh, I didn't think about the order that I was putting my units in, and this guy ended up being the general, so I'm going to have to be sort of careful with him. Um, although, winning the battle is not really the purpose of this, this video here, it's just to showcase what the battle's like and how things look. So we can see here, it's not like vanilla Medieval 2. And again, I don't want to go through and showcase every single unit, because this will end up being a 40 minute long video. But, you know, we got the Varangian Guard here. These are the, the, the sort of the mainstay of the Byzantine army, the Skutatoi. And they've got two different types of Skutatoi swordsmen and the spear types. Uh, we've got the Guzmuli, which are which are crossbowmen that are recruited from cities. And you've got swords, these Kastrofalakes. Uh, these are swordsmen recruited from the, the city, sort of like Byzantine infantry. So they're given, a lot of units are given more historical names. And then over here, you've got the Scolarii, which are, I think that they're their the cataphracts and then some light cavalry over here so given more historical names and then we've got the Turks over here we've got some Janissary troops these are of course di from different uh, it's not, not trying to be historically accurate you know for time periods it's just this is what's available so 
lot, a lot of variety of like good quality speed, but you can see the detail is significantly different from vanilla. That's the main thing I want to get at. Now, if you're the kind of person that doesn't care about how things look, then don't worry about this part of the video. But if you are, because the th thing is, personally, I don't really care about this kind of stuff, but I know a lot of people do, which is why I'm showing it. Um, you know, I can't really comment on how historically accurate it all is, but what I can say is that it's a much greater variety and much more detail than what vanilla has to offer. I believe they got some cavalry somewhere as well. Where'd they put them? I gave them... Oh, there, there's some of it. They're fiery cavalry. I'm pretty sure there's another one hiding... Yeah, around over here. Those guys are absolute pain in the ass to, to deal with. So what I'll do is I'll just pause the recording until they move forward a little bit, and then we can showcase how the battle actually looks like. Okay, here we go. So the Turks are coming in with their with their missile units, long-range horse archers, and we got our crossbows over here. Don't expect the AI to to do an amazing job. They haven't organized themselves very well. Um, there's not too much that people can do, you know, modders in that regard, to, to fix, you know, lousy AI. That's just the way it is. So at the moment, it's evenly matched, but they're really not, not organized. We've also got over here, the flamethrowers, a unit that are, uh, or si sorry, Sifonatores. Uh, but yeah, they, they shoot flames. So they're a unit pretty much straight out of uh, the Crusades campaign for Medieval 2. And they're recruitable only at Constantinople. Mm, still evenly matched. One thing that I've noted about Stanley Steel 6.4, like it's not a huge deal, but it does slow down the, the, the battles a, just a little bit. Like when they get into a fight, like units don't break instantly like they do in say, in say vanilla. Alright, we're not winning the skirmish yet, so let's charge forward. As I've said, it's, it's just, it's more Medieval 2, which there's nothing wrong with that, I think. Medieval 2 is a great game. I'll try and flank him. The Byzantine army in this is actually very strong. Also, in terms of the music, they've used all of the uh, the, the Kingdoms tracks. So, from Medieval 2 and from Kingdoms. But also, I believe there's some tracks from Medieval 1 in there as well. So, if you like the soundtracks from Medieval 1, they're in it. And I don't think they've used any non-copyrighted music. So, it's good for us YouTubers. Because, like, if I was to play Third Age Total War, I can't play any of the, the, the music in Third Age Total War. Because... It's, it's, I just can't get copyright claims straight away. It's all Lord of the Rings music. You know, for the most part. Now in this, it does seem like the cavalry are a lot... It's, it, it, they feel a lot heavier. They, if you the thought that they were unresponsive dead. in Good, Medieval 2 Vanilla, they can be pretty Brain unresponsive in this. Especially the, the super heavy arm. cavalry like the Scolarii. They are really fucking slow. But there's some units, you know, like these, they are you know, reasonably fast. Not super fast. I've, more of the, the, like, the Kuman, the really light 
cavalry. They're, they're, they're extremely fast. You know, comparatively speaking. It is unwise to praise the day before so you can sunset. see... But our These guys held out a little bit longer than what they would have been here. Like, because their general was dead, don't forget. I had to charge into them twice. And these aren't exactly... Like, knights or anything. These are you know, heavy spearmen. Nothing spectacular. They do hold out a lot better than they do in vanilla. Which, you know, in vanilla, you, you can rout an army very easily. Even mailed knights. Uh, you give them a good flanking and they're, they're gone. The enemy are badly blooded. They have lost half their men. Well, it looks like we've won this, but that's okay. It's just meant to showcase what the battles are like. So... These are two very different factions. Oh, I didn't, I didn't use these guys. I should see if I can get a flame in. I mean, if you've played uh, the Crusades campaign in Medieval 2, it looks exactly the same. So we'll, we'll just see if I can get a get a flame shot in. Hired this unit, didn't even use it. The battle is in our favor. Don't the battle before we're done. Ah, oh, damn it. Okay, look, it doesn't matter. Look, if you've seen it before, are they gonna? No, they're not gonna get a chance to do it. And that's more or less how it works. So, overall, what do I think of the mod? This is actually my favorite mod of all time for any game. Of course, Medieval 2 is my favorite game, and this is my favorite mod. I've probably played this mod more than anything, any other game. Now, comparing it to Medieval 2, I'd probably give this a rating of 9.5. It does crash a little bit, but any mod that pushes an engine this much would crash. Uh, my recommendations to people, if you're going to download this mod, uh, this mod, Make sure you also install the large address aware. What that does is just allows Medieval 2's engine to access more of your RAM. I think it's it's hard coded to only access two gigabytes of RAM, so the large address allows it to get more. And that's the main reason for crashing. You know, there's just so much detail in this game, in this mod. The more battles you play, it just stores so much stuff in your RAM. Eventually, you know, the engine just shits itself, and you're out of RAM. It, th it thinks it's out of RAM, so highly recommend you install a large address aware. That being said, I'm able to play five, six hour sessions of this game without it ever crashing. Um, the enemy certainly seen a lot come. worse through other campaigns. This is oh, a man, great victory, victory. About that. worthy of only the So yeah, I give this a rating of 9.5 out of 10. Like I said, it's an amazing mod. If you love Medieval 2 and you haven't played this mod, I'd recommend checking it out. Anyway, that's the end of this mod review. Let me know in the comments below what you think, how well I've covered it, and what mod you'd like me to cover next time. I will, as I continue to do these mod reviews, I'll get more experience with, you know, how how to ad how to address these mods. Um, just like with the top five videos. The, the first few top five videos were shite, and I got better with them. It all takes practice, and I need your, your feedback to, to help me get better at doing these. So let me know what you liked hearing about and what I you thought I rambled maybe too much on. Let me know what you want me to focus on so that I can make these mod reviews the best that they can be. Anyway, I'll see you with the next mod review. Please let me know which one that's going to be. See you next time, fuckers.